In this next unit, we're going to look at semiconductor devices, in particular diodes and transistors. My name is Lee Brinton. I'm an electrical engineering instructor at Salt Lake Community College. In this, we'll start out our discussion by looking at the basics of semiconductors. We'll look at the crystalline structure. We'll look at the type of electrical bonding that takes place. And we'll also introduce the concept of dopants. We'll then look at the PN junction and how the PN junction forms a device known as a diode. We'll look at how diodes act and then also introduce some basic concepts associated with analyzing circuits that contain diodes. We're then going to look at transistors, two different types of transistors. Um, the bijunction transistors, or BJTs as they're referred to, and then also look at field effect transistors, or MOSFETs. And then we'll look at how transistors can be used to create the basics of digital log logic circuit. Materials with loosely bound electrons that are free to move with an when an electrical potential is applied and thus are capable of carrying electrical current are known as conductors. Metals are particularly effective conductors. On the other hand, materials with tightly bound electrons are poor conductors of electrical, concurrent, of electrical current and are referred to as insulators. Insulators are typically made of glass, ceramics, and plastic. And then somewhere in between the metals and the insulators are materials that are called semiconductors. These semiconductor materials can have their current carrying properties modified through manufacturing processes and the electrical voltages in the circuits around them. So under certain circumstances, they serve as insulators. Under other circumstances, they serve as conductors. And that electrical property can be changed electrically in the circuit. The metals fall generally in the more center part of the um, periodic table. You'll recognize a number of these, manganese, iron, cobalt, nickel, copper, zinc. In this column here in particular are the best conductors, copper, silver, and gold. Directly next to them, to the uh, metals, come the semiconductors. As we'll see, they can be made to either conduct or insulate depending on the electrical conditions surrounding them. Notice that carbon, silicon, and germanium all lie in the same column where they have four valence electrons. The chemistry of the atoms in this column here are very much similar. Silicon and germanium are two of the common semiconductor substrates or semiconductor materials that are used for um, electronic circuitry. A new and uh, very interesting area is using carbon, or as they refer to them, organic semiconductors. These semiconductor materials that lie in the 4A column, carbon, silicon, and germanium, all consist of, or all have electrons of this um, structure. The S orbital is completely full, and then the next orbitals, the P orbitals, to fit the next orbitals to fill the P orbitals have two electrons that would typically fall in the atomic orbitals. But it turns out that there is a lower electrical state or a lower potential energy state for these four electrons if they form four hybrid orbitals, each with one electron. These are called molecular orbitals. And these four molecular orbitals consisting of two S electrons and two P orbital and two P electrons lie along the axes of a tetrahedron. They're evenly spaced between each other and form an electrically or a, a, a thermodynamically or an energy um, a, a minimum or a lower energy state than if they formed in the separate um, or th than if those uh, electrons were found in the separate um, atomic orbitals. Thus, atoms in this column form a crystalline structure. Diamond is the crystalline structure of carbon. And I have done here the, the, um, a two-dimensional rendition of the silicon crystal, showing a silicon atom, each silicon atom, with four valence electrons, and its neighboring atom with also four electrons. And so each of these silicon atoms shares, for example, 
this silicon atom shares one electron with this neighbor, another electron with this neighbor, another electron with this neighbor, and another electron with this neighbor. So its four valence electrons are paired with each of one of the four neighboring electrons, all filling four covalent bonds. These covalent bonds are very strong and represent a very low stable energy environment. Through a process known as doping, silicon atoms can be replaced in the crystalline structure with other atoms known as dopants. There's two different types of, of dopants that are typically used. A um, dopant referred to as a p-type dopant has only three valence electrons. So here in this case it's boron. Boron, the blue electrons are the boron electrons and there's only three valence electrons in boron. When such an atom replaces a silicon atom in the crystal, a hole is formed or a place where there, there's room for one more electron. Although still electrically neutral, the dopant has the same number of positively charged electrons in the nucleus as it has electrons. There is one orbital that's not filled. So boron is a common p-type dopant and it has only three valence electrons. N-type dopants have five valence electrons. One, or more than, one more than is necessary to fill the four covalent bonds. So for example, we have phosphorus here. Again, its electrons are blue. There's one, two, three, four, five electrons associated with the phosphorus. Four of them will bond with the nearest neighbors but there's, fifth, but there's a fifth electron with no place to go. Lying out there, it's free then to move and become a current carrying or a charge carrying part of the current. Phosphorus and arsenic are common n-type dopants. If we go back and look at the periodic table, we see that boron falls in the column just to the left of our semiconductor column, and it has only three valence electrons. On the other hand, phosphorus and arsenic fall in column just to the right of the semiconductor column and have five valence electrons. So those in this column represent the n-type dopants and those in this column represent the p-type dopants. The manufacturing process of making semiconductor devices such as transistors and uh, diodes then is to create areas within the semiconductor, within the silicon substrate, that have either p-type dopants replacing silicon atoms, thus creating an area of n-type semiconductor that has extra electrons, or replacing silicon atoms in the semiconductor crystal with p-type dopants, such as boron, that have only three valence electrons, thus leaving a hole. Thus this process consists of creating areas that have an abundance of holes or places where there's room for one more electron and areas in the semiconductor that has a surplus of electrons, one electrical one. So we're going to refer to those areas and, and designate those areas with extra electrons as having extra negative charge, but keep in mind that at this point is still electrically neutral. There isn't necessarily a charge separation or a voltage at this point. We'll get into what happens in the manufacturing process at this interface in the next video.